The tower controllers sound the alarm. According to government reports, 95% of passengers involved in plane crashes live to tell the tale. But after today's video, you might not be so sure. Because I have compiled the most horrific plane crashes and the stories of three people that miraculously survived them. Looking at the images from this wreckage, the mangled seats, the barely intact fuselage, it's hard to imagine anyone surviving such a horrific accident. And even though the crash would claim the lives of 71, six people somehow managed to walk away alive. And among the people on board were the members of the Chape Coense soccer team on their way to Colombia, where they would compete in the final round for the South American Cup. And this is one of the last photos of the team just before takeoff, and a few hours later that small charter plane in the background would turn into this unrecognizable pile of scrap metal. And the plane departed from Bolivia around 5pm, and at 9.54 the plane reported electrical issues and began circling the runway, and shortly after that disappeared off the radar, leaving authorities to fear the worst. Experts say that the repeated circling of the runway along with the sudden descent indicates that the pilots were flying blind and they had to look for the runway manually before running out of fuel resulting in the crash landing. Among those six survivors was crew member Erwin Tumiri and he says the only thing that saved him was remembering his safety training where he was instructed to put his luggage in between his legs and go into the fetal position. And Irwin would tell reporters that he glanced around the cabin just moments before impact and many of the passengers were standing up from their seats and shouting and them doing that resulted in them being flung wildly around the cabin where they were almost killed instantly upon impact. Now it's already crazy enough to have cheated death once, but twice is really pushing it. In 2021, Irwin was riding a bus to work much like this one over dangerous mountain terrain when all of a sudden the soft ground beneath the bus gave out resulting in it flipping and tumbling down the side of a cliff. And holding on fiercely to the seat in front of him, he somehow manages to stay conscious throughout witnessing everything that was happening in the cabin in front of him. He would describe the passengers as being thrown around and tumbled as if in the inside of a washing machine and he was forced to watch dozens of people either be killed or sustain serious injuries. March 27, 1977 would go down in history as one of the deadliest aviation incidents and remains that way even to this day with a whopping death count of 583 people. Complications started with a bomb going off at Gran Canaria Airport and the threat of a second forced flights to be diverted to North Tenerife Airport, one of the adjacent Canary Islands approximately 100 kilometers away. This change overwhelmed the small airport leaving some of the freshly landed planes parked on the middle of the runway awaiting their turn for the jet bridge to offload their passengers. To add to the already stressful situation, a heavy fog rolled in drastically reducing visibility making all the pilots rely solely on air traffic control for decisions. Coupling the fog with the airport's primitive technology and lack of ground radar, the controller was only able to tell where each airplane was by voice reports over the radio. So this means that before any plane is about to take off, the controller would have to confirm with each of the planes there where they were at that given moment and ensure that none of them are currently on the runway blocking the plane about to take off. And one such plane was a Pan Am flight which confirmed with the controller that it was still on the runway. But at the same time, a KLM flight makes its final turn onto the same runway preparing for takeoff. And according to the black box recordings, the pilot was given a standby signal from the controller but proceeded to take off anyways. Van Zanten is one of Holland's star pilots. 
He was so highly regarded that KLM used his face in their advertising. He'd been a commercial pilot for 27 years and had flown more than 11,700 hours. It's shocking that such an experienced pilot would make such a drastic error. Van Zanten barrels down the runway and just seconds before impact the two planes see each other with the Pan Am plane veering hard to the left and Van Zanten pulling up so sharply that the tail scraped the runway. He almost made it too. The nose and the front wheels cleared the Pan Am but one of the engines struck the plane slicing off its upper deck completely. The final irony in all this was that Van Zanten took on an extra 55,000 liters of fuel to save refueling time later and the extra fuel may have denied the aircraft the extra few meters in height required that could have prevented this disaster. And after striking the Pan Am aircraft, Van Zanten loses control and crashes further down the runway, killing everyone on board instantaneously. Emergency responders rushed to the scene and immediately worked at putting out that fire from the crashed aircraft, but because of the dense fog around the airport didn't see that the Pan Am plane had now burst into flames. Determined to escape, the passengers began jumping from the plane, but in the frenzy of everyone trying to escape at once, people started landing on this poor lady that jumped first, slowly breaking every single bone in her body with each person that landed on her. A total of 61 people managed to jump from the plane successfully, and these would end up being the only survivors as the vast majority of the Pan Am passengers opted to stay in the fuselage and await rescue. Unfortunately, they would never make it out, and moments later the plane was ripped apart by a series of explosions. Of the survivors, one of the most notable was Jack Rideau, who sustained third degree burns both on his face and on his arms, rescuing 12 people out of the burning aircraft and was sent a letter by the then president Jimmy Carter to express his gratitude on behalf of the nation. When talking about plane crash survivors, it would practically be a crime if I didn't mention Julianne Kopka, the woman who fell from the sky and lived to tell the tale. It was Christmas Eve in Lima, Peru, and Julianne had just graduated from high school and was flying with her mother to reunite with her dad in their home city of Panguana. It's worth noting that her father, Hans Wilhelm, urged his wife not to fly with the Lanza airline because they had a poor reputation, but because they were in a rush, and being that it was on Christmas Eve, of course, they didn't really have much of a choice. So they were in the process of flying through this massive thunderstorm when the plane was struck by lightning, causing it to plummet out of the sky. The fuselage cracked and Julianne was sucked out of the plane into the night sky and for a brief moment she remained conscious, thinking to herself how the trees below looked like heads of broccoli. When she came to, Julianne was now in the Amazon rainforest, still strapped to her seat with no life-threatening injuries. She was badly beaten and bruised from falling nearly two miles out of the sky and it took her a full day to be able to stand. Luckily, she found a bag of candy near the crash site which she rationed carefully and used raindrops on leaves for hydration. On her fourth day in the rainforest, she discovered a bench with three passengers that had been rammed head first into the ground with only their feet being visible. Based on the nail polish they wore, Julianne breathed a sigh of relief that at least none of those bodies were her mother's, but then she remembered something. Her father had always told her that should she ever find herself lost in the rainforest like this, to look for a stream, follow it, and it will almost certainly bring you to civilization. After wading through crocodile infested rivers for days, she finally found a boat parked on the riverbank and thought it was a hallucination at first. She walked up to the boat and grabbed it just to confirm that it was real, and when she confirmed that it was, got a huge kick of adrenaline. Walking up onto the shore, she found a gas can and poured the fuel all over her wounds to clean the maggots from them and then passes out from the pain on the riverbank. The next day, she hears the voices of men and she introduces herself in Spanish, telling them what happened. In the following days, she would be reunited with her father and after seeing her alive, he was absolutely in disbelief and had no words. Unfortunately, Julianne's mother would not make it, although she did initially survive the crash. She was badly injured and unable to move, and because of this, 
died a few days later. Here is a picture of Julianne returning to the crash site in 1998.